There is an intriguing fascination with building a Game Boy Pocket Color in the Game Boy modding community, and at this point there's actually a handful of options on how to do so, which might not sound like a lot, but at one point there was like one? But I'm your cool Uncle Marissa, and I am among the many people who dream of stuffing a Game Boy Color's internals into a Game Boy Pocket. There's nothing wrong with it. There are dozens of us. Dozens! Now, if you missed my last Game Boy Pocket Color video, which was on Natalie the Nerd's very inventive Poco, go and watch the intro on that, because the intro on that was actually really good, and I covered a lot. <laughs> of like, what is the Game Boy Pocket? Like, why would you make it? What is the history of like Game Boy Pocket mods? And I don't really want to do that again, especially like if you've already watched that one. So feel free to go pause this video, um, open that in the tab, watch the intro on that, maybe the whole thing, and then come back here. <laughs> Because today we are going to go through a different way of building a Game Boy Pocket Color. And I'm talking about Bucket Mouse's Game Boy Pocket Color Board. So there are currently three big Game Boy Pocket boards that are on the market. There is one by N64 Freak, one by Skimzor, and one by Bucket Mouse slash Mouse Bite Labs. There's a few differences between them. Uh, Jack V, who builds um, pocket color commissions and has built probably countless ones by now, has a really great comparison of the three boards, and you can see that in my description below if you want to do deeper reading. But just to say why I chose the Mouse Byte Labs is that it uses mostly new components, which is just convenient, although more expensive. And what really pulled me in was that at the time, uh, it was the only one of these boards that maintains the contrast wheel on the pocket and actually gives it a function. And that function is you can go up to change the brightness, down to change the color palette, and even press it in to do a reset of your Game Boy. So that's incredibly neat. Now I haven't built the other two, I don't have any plans to, so I don't really have any hands-on comparison beyond that, but that is the one that I went with. Now one amazing thing that makes this very accessible <laughs> in the grand scheme of things is um, Bucket Mouse has a really really good instruction manual for this. The github for it is really well written out, um, the troubleshooting is great, he's got like uh, really neat documents uh, showing for example like what each CPU pin does so that can help you with troubleshooting. Plus I found out pretty later on in my process that he has his own discord where people are super helpful. Now of course he himself is not obligated to give you any uh, troubleshooting help or advice but there's actually a lot of people on there who have built this board, who have experienced building, you know, maybe one to many more of this board who are very eager and happy to give advice. So that's really cool that there is a community around it that are so willing to help as well. In addition to, again, the GitHub being super, super helpful. And the first thing in this GitHub, not literally the first thing, but early on, is a very good piece of advice given to us by Bucket Mouse, which is, of course, you need a power regulator board. And there are a few options on the market. I think the only one that I know of that is actually um, pre-made is Frogo Customs Power Boards. Um, the rest you would get the board and build the rest out yourself. And Bucket Mouse also has a power board and he says that you should build it. And if you can't build that, don't attempt the Game Boy Pocket Color. And I think that's really cool. I think that's a really cool thing to say because it gives you something that you can practice on it gives you something to gauge your skills and it gives you something that will have an actual real life application in the project that you plan to do. So my experience with the power board, 
And I think that this will kind of go into gauging whether you, dear viewer, should attempt this or should, you know, desire to attempt this. I've been soldering for a while now. A big step for that was getting a microscope that helped so much. And I think that it is very challenging to do this project without a microscope. So I really recommend one. You can get an okay microscope like me for like 60 bucks. And you'll see what I mean by okay, cause like my footage is not the most beautiful, but when I'm actually using it, I can see what's going on. And that's ultimately what matters. And you should be good with uh, soldering. You shouldn't be regularly burning things, tearing off pads, accidents happen, obviously. But if it's a common occurrence for you, if you still don't know how to control things uh, in a super fine fashion, then maybe practice more just getting a hang of soldering first. The project also rightfully calls for a hot air station and or a hot plate. Uh, I got a hot air station myself and I was very lucky to have um, one of my subscribers, one of my nerd fuse, gift me a hot plate for uh, my birthday. And so I had both of these and the usage of these two uh, appliances, tools, tools on the power board helped me understand my process, which I'll talk about in a bit because it's going to be different for everyone. I just want to share my own, my own feelings. So you'll need one of those. And the reason for that is there are going to be components where, uh, you know, like a QFN package. So that means all the like, solder points are underneath so you can't you physically reach them uh, so you need a way to um, go generate heat around it to melt on obviously you'll need a multimeter I, I feel like you should have one by now and from there you can try your hand at the power boards buy more than one buy two or three so for me the first power board became a practice power board i ended up destroying it kind of like half on purpose trying to learn how to use my hot plate then i had a second and third power board and from there with the second i was confident in my skills but still kind of like okay like i've got the knowledge i know what i'm doing but it wasn't perfect it was still like a slower process with my third power board what i did was i took the leftover components i had which i had obviously quite a few and i figured let's just populate this board with what i have left and then i can hang on to it in case i ever need another one and just buy the parts that i need but while populating that board i realized that went much smoother, much cleaner, because by that point, I really knew what my technique was and what I was doing. And here's my technique. So I was using solder paste, um, no clean solder paste, which, you know, is recommended for if you are putting down these kinds of components. If you can get a, a, a stencil for this, then I think that will help you a lot as well. I did not have a stencil. And I realized that I really like the hot plate for soldering IC chips, as well as of course, um, QFN packages, but I didn't actually like it very much for um, SMD components like capacitors and things like that. For those, I preferred the hot air gun. And for those, I would just um, put my board on the hot plate and set that to 100. Uh, thank you so much to Chillwatt actually for this um, great suggestion. And that would help heat it up from behind and then I would use the hot air gun on it. And that was a lot better for my process. I just like to have that control over things um, when it comes to soldering those uh, micro components and the hot air gun provides that whereas the hot plate does not because you know if you, you want to you can't <laughs> stop something or you can't just like stop the heat with the hot plate you're gonna burn yourself but ultimately that's just what my preference was and honestly i would kind of prefer it if i just stuck to one or the other you know it'd be more like less stuff on the table and there's a lot of people 
if you go into any sort of uh, Discord where people are modding or working with electronics and they're just like, you know, I hate hot plates or I hate hot air stations. So it's about finding what works for you and learning how to use that. So I think that if you are good at soldering and you know the principle of it, you're not making mistakes all the time, but you don't have a hot air gun or hot plate, this project might be a good incentive to learn how to use those. And the power board does offer you a sort of practice board for that. Of course, you could also just get a practice board. Ultimately, up to you. Let me tell you, the actual Game Boy Color, Game Boy Pocket Color board was much less of a struggle for me than, <laughs> than the power board because it doesn't have any sort of like QFN stuff on it. And um, I feel like things are more clearly marked. I'm don't have like a science brain, which I hope is reassuring to you. Like you don't, you don't have to be an engineer to do this. In one of Mako's streams, I think he was like, it's like a glorified solder practice board. And I think that's, that's mean, but you know, I, yeah, I guess like you're not really, you're not coming up with things, but I feel like that could go for any sort of mod. Anyway, so if you have <laughs> that experience, I think then that you are in a good place to move forward. So we had the power board, I got the power board ready, um, and then it was time to go to the Game Boy Pocket Color. Okay, so now you've ordered your board, you've ordered all your little parts, you've got your donor board. Uh, what now? Let's just get to the soldering video. How about that? No, no, no. Whoa! I got some tips. If you have a soldering mat or any sort of form of organizational um, box or pillbox, maybe, I don't know, anything that can organize your components, get that out. If you don't have one, get one. I used to at one point use an ice cube tray where I'd written in Sharpie inside each tray, like what's what, although you would need a couple of ice cube trays if you were doing this. This will make your life so much more easier. Everything's gonna come in these tiny little bags and it's gonna come with a uh, packing list which has a number for each item, a line number, item number, uh, as well as a description of what it is. Take out the number of components that you need and put them in the corresponding uh, square or container to that number on your invoice. That will help you so much. You don't wanna be rifling through bags through this. Um, you don't want things getting mixed up with each other and you want to have the exact number out or you know, like a universal number for all of them. Like if you wanna keep out one extra for each then do it for everything that you can because that way if a component pops from one container uh, from its house into another one's house, a lot of these capacitors are unmarked and look exactly the same. So what are you gonna do? You're not gonna know. Yes, I am speaking from experience and this is what helped me figure out where the component, where the capacitor that popped out landed. Because when I was all done, I was like, okay, there's an extra one in this specific spot. So I'm gonna test all the ones that fall under line number 15 and see which one is the wrong capacitor. Also work in short spurts. Don't inhale too many fumes. Please get a fume extractor for this at least. Like the flux fumes are pretty nuts. So that's all the prep tips I have for you. So I'm gonna show you some video footage of uh, the soldering. I'm not gonna post, I'm not gonna share like the whole process. That's gonna be hours and irritating, but just so you get an idea and then we'll come back over here for some final thoughts. All right, let's go. There are a handful of through hole components mainly that you need to harvest from the Game Boy Color board, such as the DC jack, the headphone jack, link port, cart reader. You will definitely need a solder sucker for these. Uh, the engineer solder sucker is kind of the standard. It sucks and it's pretty affordable. If you want a good lesson on how to remove the cartridge slot such a pain in the butt, but Jack has some really great 
examples on his Instagram. That'll be linked in the description. Jack has a lot of great tips that he doesn't gatekeep for building a Game Boy Pocket Color. And also if you aren't someone who wants to or has the ability to build your own, he also sells built boards and built um, units for really fair prices. In terms of when you should take these components off, it's kind of up to you. You just don't want to lose anything. I actually had my cat steal the DC jack on this board and I'm so glad that it was the DC jack because I initially thought she stole the headphone jack and those are literally impossible to find aftermarket. The one big tip I have for you here is flux. Just flux it up, it'll make things so much easier. This is actually a tip that Jack shared for removing these through-hole components after using the solder sucker. Um, using some extra flux and hot air can help get any more stubborn pieces out. Uh, you'll see this is also what he does with his uh, cart slots. And you know, I don't know, He's he's got the magic touch when it comes to cart slots. Those things are a pain. All right, your eyes don't have jaundice. This is a different board. I thought I'd take the opportunity to record some parts that I normally wouldn't with a kind of just lightweight, cheapo camera. Hopefully this is better than nothing, uh, but I am just using solder paste and I like to start on the bottom right of the board and then go counterclockwise. I don't know, it just feels right. And I'm using these straight tweezers to apply the solder paste. If you get a tube of solder paste, don't do what I did. Uh, clean your syringe tip and everything thoroughly before you use it again, otherwise it's gonna get all gunked up and you'll have to use tweezers or something. But honestly, the tweezers are not terrible. They're pretty good for this application. Obviously don't scratch your board. Just one note on how I'm doing this. With the yellow board, I'm using even less solder paste than I did in my first board because ultimately at the end, I'm going to go over everything with my soldering iron. So it's just much easier to deal with not enough solder on these components as opposed to too much solder. Obviously that doesn't apply to anything that's like a QFN package or something where you can't see. I then use my curved tweezers to place the components on. Now be very careful moving things with your tweezers because if you don't have a good grip on it, they will fly out and you will lose them forever. And it could be even worse. They could fly into a uh, place where you're keeping your other components and they look exactly the same and you can't tell the difference and you're gonna lose your mind. So what I like to do is pick up with my tweezers, place them down sort of halfway, then get a better grip on them and then bring them up onto the board so that there's a shorter distance traveled and less risk of dropping or flying or any other athletic movements. All right, and now I'm just gonna place a hot plate underneath where I'm going to work and I'm gonna set the hot plate to 100 degrees Celsius. The hot plate actually helps a lot using conjunction because just adding that heat from underneath, it will help things heat up more evenly. It will help the solder paste actually flow better as well. So that's a big plus because if you're using solder paste on a completely cold board, it can be very like hard to get where you want and then things stick to it and it, it's, a, it's a mess. Um, so that's super helpful. And I just set that to 100 and let it do its thing. Of course, I'm doing all of this under a microscope. And I don't know if that's cat hair or my hair, but it looks really gross under a microscope, huh? So you can see that this is my first board. I did use more solder paste than on my second board. I didn't have any issues with bridges or anything. So this is a reasonable amount of paste to use if you're looking at yours through a microscope. If you're building this without a microscope, you're crazy. Now keep in mind some components like this one, they have a correct orientation. Same with the, the tantalum capacitors, those orange squares you see on the top left, the line goes towards positive. And here's the exciting part. 
it. <laughs> it's sitting on my hot plate and I'm going over it with my hot air gun. I have it, I think, uh, like three something, um, 320 and maybe 40% airflow. I'm not entirely sure, but be careful with the airflow. Obviously don't go too high because then your pieces will fly around. If we take a look at D1 right now, we see that the uh, lines on one side indicate that that is the positive side. Make sure you pay attention to those bits. And I mean, basically you keep going like this all around the board. And obviously while you're doing this, heck, even while you're watching this, you have Bucket Mouse's GitHub open in another tab, right? And he has a really, really helpful uh, image of the three main steps of where your board should be. So there's the first step where you sort of are putting on most of the components, the um, SMD components and capacitors, etc. Then the next step, you've added the IC chips and the ribbon connector and uh, any SMD components that are kind of surrounding them that you don't want to add until that point. And then finally, you have all of your through hole components and all the, you know, the Game Boy bits, except for your um, cartridge slot. So follow that, that will help you a lot. Don't just populate the entire board in one go. Uh, here's an example of I use too much solder paste. So it's kind of balled up and there's like a bit of a cold joint. When it comes to that, you can just fix that with a soldering iron. By the way, let's just pause here. And um, this is where uh, Bucket Mouse mentioned to use 100 hey. UF caps on all four of these because that is going to help guarantee uh, that the touch sensor on your Q5 display uh, will not just set off like crazy. Because initially when I just went off of what was on the bill of materials at the time, I was getting a lot of just, my, my display needed exorcism. So he told me to swap those out, I did. And uh, I also made the wires shorter to my display and everything was smooth sailing. We've been looking at the microscope for way too long. So um, this is just a reminder of how tiny these components are.
for these chips, uh, the way you add the solder paste, uh, you can, I don't know, do a tiny bit on each leg or like I'm doing here, you can just run a line across it. We are absolutely going to be touching this up later uh, using drag soldering. Uh, so for that, a knife style tip, I think is the best from my personal preference and a lot of flux. If you use too little, again, that's better than using too much. So don't be afraid to wipe away the solder paste if you made a mistake and start over. It's very measure twice, cut once. And now I'm putting the SRAM chip on. Did you notice? Because I didn't notice that I put it on flipped. Um, I finished and nothing was working and uh, bless the people of Discord. I started out in the modded Game Boy, uh, Game Boy Club Discord and uh, people were like, you know, just take out your power board and test it and try again and reflow it. And I did so, so many things. I tested the entire board, um, like with the test points, everything was beeping properly. Um, <laughs> and then someone was like, why don't you try Bucket Mouse's Discord? And I did. And Bucket Mouse uh, himself was like, your RAM is backwards. Now we do need to harvest the CPU and the crystal from our GBC. To do that, hot plate is my personal favorite way of doing this. You can do it with hot air too, obviously. Just cover that boy in flux and uh, heat her up. Do not pull it off. If it's not coming off easily, if it's not just lifting off super easily with your tweezers, then it's still attached. You don't want to damage this. Lining up the CPU actually is probably took me the longest of lining up any component. You really, really want to make sure that all the legs are where they should be just to make things easier on yourself. You know, if it's not perfect and you solder it down, it's not the end of the world, but it's just easier to get it right, you know? Take an extra moment now so you don't have to take two extra moments later. And with these chips, the CPU, the RAM, the crystal, um, those are all hot plate only for me.
Attaching the FFC connector, the ribbon cable connector, definitely use a hot plate if you have one. Otherwise, take your hot air gun and go from behind. Uh, you can probably just use your soldering iron too, uh, if, if you like that sort of thing. But this is plastic, so it can melt. So just keep that in mind. And then finally, our last bits are these teeny tiny components that kind of go in between and around the IC chips and the crystal and the FFC connector that we have just put down. And we can put these down now. So with fixing the bridges on these fine pitch pins, you can take flux and put it all over and then just run your soldering iron over it. I like using the knife tip. But if you have a particularly thick part or a particularly stubborn bit of solder, some solder wick is very helpful in removing those. Obviously make sure that everything is nice and fluxy and you're not causing the solder wick to stick onto it and then pulling it off because you will probably rip off a leg and then that won't be very fun, will it? Now this is just maybe me being crazy. Maybe you don't wanna do something like this until you troubleshoot, but with all of these fine pitch ones, so the RAM, the FFC connector, and the CPU, I go over every leg and <laughs> just check for continuity to make sure that each leg is soldered on and there are no bridges. It just helps me rule out one more thing when I'm troubleshooting because it's like, oh, okay, I already did that. I already know that everything is good on that front. So I don't have to check those points. It's not a bad idea to also clean up with isopropyl alcohol at this point to check for bridges visually. The flux can cause like illusions that there are no bridges or it just causes a blur. Um, so being able to see things with more precision through isopropyl eyes can be very helpful. <laughs> also, I did this on my second board, not my first one, which I kind of regret. After you put everything down, except for the uh, FFC CPU, RAM, etc., cetera, uh, clean your board. Clean your board so it's not sticky anymore. And then once you put those ladder components on, clean your board again. Like try to clean it between every step because it's just much easier than trying to clean everything up at the very end because there's just so many little bits and stuff. I mean, if you have an ultrasonic cleaner or whatever, you're, you're good. But if you're a little peasant boy like me. Okay, we're onto our through hole components now. So nice, these are easier.
Couple of things on the board not to forget, if you are a sane person and you're going to be using rechargeable AAA batteries, make sure to bridge these two points on the bottom right, uh, the DC and BT. Just use some wire and bridge it. soldering on the cart connector, that's a lot of fun. Now when you're done, clean up the flux, uh, snip your pins down. You can go over them again with a soldering iron to make sure the connections are good and cover it up with a piece of Kapton tape. Now in terms of display options, there's two main options. There's the Q5 display and there is the Cloud Game Store display, which I did do a video review on. You can check that out if you like. But another thing that caught my attention, which I'm going to show you guys now, is there is someone on Taobao who does laminated screens of both of these. So using a proxy service, I used PandaBuy. SuperBuy is also a very popular choice among folks. I got this laminated screen. Now I do have to say I wasn't jonesing for a laminated screen because the Q5 screen looks really good in the pocket color. The gap is not insanely noticeable or anything to me, but hey, I wanna try something new, right? Now these laminated screens, they come uh, without the board if you buy the Q5 version. So you see, it is just the screen. He's cut the shell in order to fit it in. Shell cutting is not really, the, I think, the biggest issue here. It's more so getting that laminated effect and actually sticking the screen onto the lens that causes more trouble than it maybe is worth. So I won't go through the installation process. You can see that on Bucket Mouse's GitHub. It's 
Very simple. It's just a matter of wiring some stuff. But since I had already set up my initial display, I didn't have to center the screen or anything. All the settings are saved. All right, and here we are. Excuse the moiré effect. Um, I think that's because of my uh, UV filter. But yeah, that that's laminated. That's laminated for sure. It looks great. All of the palette functions work. By the way, this is how the palette functions work is down and by hitting the contrast wheel up, you change brightness. If you've bridged the reset pads on your board, pressing in will cause a reset. But now what's interesting is this gap. I am not a huge fan of this gap. Jack mentioned on the Bucket Mouse Discord when I asked about this curiosity, that this Taobao seller uses cloud game store lenses on all the screens and all the shelves. So it's a little bit too small for the funny playing one. And I only noticed after the fact that it has the power LED cutout, whereas my funny playing lens did not. So I just have an empty space there. <laughs> um, so I don't know how I feel about it. I don't think it's worth it, to be honest. Others may disagree. Now on the note of things being warped, I had trouble with these funny playing shells. My first funny playing shell, it just started cracking and chipping. It wasn't an issue with screws being too tight. I know we all love to point to that first because often it is the truth, but I will show you a picture. It started flaking. And this shell from Taobao, it is not sitting flush at all. In fact, it is curve. This is a funny playing shell. This is not the Taobao seller's fault. I even filed down the contrast wheel uh, bump as well as the link port and volume wheel to no avail. And you see there is just this curve on the top shell that's causing it to not really meet the back shell. So I am not super confident that this is going to hold up any better than the last shell. In fact, I am less confident. I did try to do some mitigation prior to it by not installing the center screw on the PCB. But, you know, I thought maybe CGS shells are better, but people who have CGS shells and then they get damaged. And <laughs> they're like, oh, I should have gotten a funny playing and vice versa, grass is always greener, plastic's always stronger on the other side. So if you don't have a color in mind, I would strongly suggest you fall in love with an opaque build. If it's crumbling inside or whatever, how will you know? And again, we've got this lovely gap, which I think is so funny because laminated helps you not get dust in, right? It's gonna get dusty. All right, now I wanna show you one more tip and that is how to trim your shell to put in Game Boy Color buttons because I just wanna make everything super difficult for myself, right? But all you need is uh, plastic snippers. You can use flush cutters like I did if you're a messy little thing. Uh, and then you can use a file followed by some finishing polish or acetone or whatever works for you to clean up that scratch. Do not cut your buttons. It just makes your experience with the buttons awful. If you are using something more precise like model plastic snippers, that little plastic bit between the two legs on the A button, you can probably achieve that. If you're not, it'll probably fall out. Uh, it did for me. It doesn't matter. The A button will continue to stay in place. We are not a lithium ion Game Boy battery household. I like rechargeable double and triple A's and conveniently Xstar sent me these batteries to try out. The double A batteries are 2,150 milliamp per hours and the triple A's are 750 milliamp per hours and 1.5 volts as opposed to the usual 1.2 on triple A's. And I want to see how they stand up to the other batteries I have. So here we have the classic Lada IKEA AAA's 750 milliamp per hours. And then I got these EBL random brand, supposedly 1100 milliamp per hours batteries from Amazon once when I needed batteries fast. And of course we have the XTAR ones, which also might I add go very well with my color scheme. 
So I ran the pocket color with these batteries fresh. I ran a stopwatch ROM and I put it on highest brightness and the ROM was being played on an easy flash flash card, which as we know is also quite power hungry. So how did they stack up? First off, I had the EBL batteries that supposedly are 1100 milliamp hours and they only got up to 150 minutes. Now I say only because the Lada batteries, which say they are 750 milliamp hours, also got to 150 minutes. So someone's not telling the truth here. <laughs> and finally, the X-Star batteries. Came out to 190 minutes, beating out both the other batteries. That's really, really impressive. And I'm really excited to try their AA batteries as well as their 1000 milliamp per hour AAA battery. I do wish I had some Antelope Pros to pit against this competition. Alas, I don't, but I'm very happy with swapping between the X-Star batteries and the Lotta batteries. Wow, <laughs> the EVL ones are going to be relegated to my remote. So big thank you again to X-Star. I will put a link to their site in the description. Check that out. These are really stellar batteries. No complaints here. And I think they would make a great addition to any Game Boy, especially anyone with such a power hungry mod as this. Okay, we are back and we have a Game Boy Pocket Color. I feel like I've been waiting for this moment for so long and I'm absolutely going to show off my build and talk a bit about what's in mine. But first I want to give some quick tips. Another thing that happened for me was the switch, uh, the power switch on my Game Boy Color board that I salvaged from was in very rough shape and the leaf switches, which, you know, so you have the thing that you move, right? And that has um, these little metal switches inside it kind of and they make contact with like this backing and they tell it wh where to go oh my god i'm looking at my monitor and this is not helpful at all um but <laughs> for some reason they like deteriorated just fell out um and fell apart so my two leaf switches became four tiny pieces of metal so i needed another power switch now unfortunately um there aren't really a ton of options out there for replacements um i went to helder's tech um to his website and i ordered a game boy color one and a game boy pocket one now i had ordered a game boy advance ones i believe from uh, helder before and they were very fragile and i actually one of them broke the just like the plastic part of the switch and I remember having to use the spare and thankfully that was fine a uh, similar thing happened the Game Boy Pocket switch was quite um, fragile and it ended up breaking but his Game Boy Color switches are good and sturdy and uh, the only difference it's not gonna feel the same it's gonna have like a different bump but I'm just grateful that I have a switch that can turn on and off. But that is to say, if you can find an OEM switch, do so. And if your OEM switch is in good condition, like don't, don't damage it, <laughs> treasure it. If you do end up with a uh, aftermarket switch, power switch, um, just make sure one thing, this is probably obvious, but after you solder it down, don't touch the plastic because it's got a lot of heat around it. So the plastic is going to be ultra fragile in that moment. Wait for everything to cool down before you test the power switch. If you had any similar problems to those, I hope these very specific tips helped. Otherwise, again, Bucket Mouse has really good troubleshooting guide and um, really good like graphs and stuff for testing. Sometimes just getting another pair of eyes <laughs> is gonna be really helpful because <laughs> maybe something's just upside down, man. And it's not even in the troubleshooting guide because it's kind of obvious. 
Now, a quick comparison to my other experience with a Game Boy Pocket Color. So as I said earlier in this video, my last attempt was with uh, Natalie the Nerd's uh, Poco, which was kind of an, I guess, easier version of the Pocket Color that came before it, which was from Cypher, and that involved cutting, you know, half a Game Boy Color, half a Game Boy Pocket, and very reductive explanation. Um, with Natalie, she had like a pre-populated like um, PCB bottom and you attach that to her flex board and that attaches to the top half of your Game Boy Color that you have cut in two. And uh, I had a lot of criticism for the build. Unfortunately, it just was not a smooth process. The flex board was flimsy. Um, the way, like holding them together, felt like something that you know once it's closed up, you don't want to open it again because you feel like it's just gonna turn to dust. So this board was actually a much better experience, even though the former was supposed to be an easier way. But I think ultimately it was just really bad timing for Natalie because we had Cypher's board, and that was you know that was something like no one wanted to. Attempt. very few people did because you know you're gonna like it's just the process and what if you lose your Game Boy Color in the process what if you lose your Game Boy Pocket in the process and like it, you know so she had made an easier version of that but by the time she released it we already had these three boards from Skimzor and 64 Freak and Bucket Mouse um, so the competition kind of the choice on the market was different and we actually had easier things. Ultimately, you could do Natalie's build with fewer tools, uh, but you could just like just a soldering iron. Um, there's just more, I think, space for physical damage. So I'm not like pushing you away from that. Go ahead and watch my video if you haven't already. Uh, there's just a lot more room for um, damaging the board, the flex board. You hear that Natalie is gonna be putting out her own full board too. So I think that's gonna be awesome and that's gonna fit in perfectly for like the current market. And I'm very excited to see what she does. All right, now let's take a look at my finished build. Here's the finished product in all its glory. I tried really hard to go for a different color scheme than my usual pastel greeted pink. <laughs> Um, but I did end up including green and pink nonetheless, but I really like this like raspberry lemonade vibrant colors and I've got the froggy later in the bottom left as well. The buttons are candy lemons from Lab 15 Co for Game Boy Color, but he also does have them in his own shop for Game Boy Pocket. On the back, we have the sticker. I designed this myself with a completely brand new Game Boy Pocket Color logo. I had another one in my shop, a spare. One of you picked that up, so if you end up building with it, please share. I know the running joke is that, you know, we mod, but we don't actually play on the things we, we put together. And it's so shameful that that is pretty true for me, but I found myself really playing this. I'm actually playing Pokemon Yellow. I'm not just keeping it in there for show for this video because there's just something really special about having built this from such a granular level compared to something like just an IPS mod. It's incredibly satisfying and I really do recommend it and it feels very like it's mine, you know? So thank you Bucket Mouse for the opportunity to make something like this. And thank you to all the artists out there who contributed to this build. I have to say I'm a, I'm a little sad that I don't think the shell is gonna hold up, but I think that gives the possibility for just shaking things up in the future, right? Thank you so much guys for watching. This was a really intense, fun, and highly anticipated project for me. And if you have made one before, if you're working on one, if you're thinking of one, um, please feel free to let me know in the comments. Um, feel free to join the Discord, which is now open access. We have um, set like kind of the vibe and tone for the Discord. So I really appreciate all my early access uncle and trainings. And for moving forward, uh, anyone who is a nerd few can join and chat it up, share their builds, um, share your collections, what you're playing, cat photos, 
whatever. And also I would like to say a big thank you to my February Kofi supporters. Thank you to Gerbison, Chilwat, Tim Bolognius, Ryan L, Autumn, and Complex Milk. And thank you so much to everyone who got Discord access. Again, thank you so much for anyone who's bought anything from my shop. Um, I have uh, like some merch stickers, but I also have stickers right now for consoles and cartridges. And I also have free resources um, that, you know, if you wanna make a donation, sweet. If not, they're there. Uh, for cassette inserts as well as skins, things like that. And as always, don't forget that you are always welcome at Cool Uncle's house and I can't wait to see you in the next one. Bye-bye now.